A Mighty Wind, The Annals of History, by Lord Blackwater. Chapter 6, A Story of Fury and Desire. Barnaby walked quickly through Longville, Keldorf on his heels. As they walked, the villagers stared, and this was more than their usual stares which Barnaby was used to getting. At least this time no one was throwing fairy shit at him. Barnaby suspected that the blood covering he and Keldorf had made the villagers extra wary. Barnaby, you said that we have work to do. I barely tolerate you living with me. I'm not sure my reputation can handle any more than that, Keldorf cried in response. Stick a hot dog in your hole and keep up. You don't have a choice in this. I need someone, and the blood is on your hands too, Barnaby replied with a renewed confidence in himself. But where are we going? We need to stop at the pub. I like to get pissed as much as you, Barnaby, but now doesn't seem like the time. We should get rid of Valspar's body as soon as we can. No one is going to believe that a MTF proud boy dragon killed him in my living room, Keldorf said, almost begging. Barnaby hesitated for a moment. Valspar. He was one of the few who accepted him at his worst, and he was the only one who let him rub his tootsie pop on his taint knockers. He died because of him. He had to pick himself up from this stupor and do something. Forget it. We'll deal with the body later. I know some Wendigos who'll be willing to eat that body in no time. Besides, we aren't going here for a drink. We're going here for information. Barnaby walked in and sat himself down at the bar with Keldorf. In their time living just outside of Longville, Naura had spent some time at this pub and struck up a friendship with the bartender, Lesbianus. Sure, the two of them had mashed their menstruals once in a while, but they were just friends for the most part. If anyone knew where Naura was, it was Lesbianus. Barnaby looked down the line of the bar and saw her standing at the end. She was sucking down long green beans, the longest Barnaby had ever seen. She picked the beans up one by one, holding them over her mouth before dropping them in whole. But instead of swallowing, like any good green bean eater would, she'd pull them back through clenched teeth, popping out all the beans into her mouth with a moan of satisfaction. They sat for a few minutes, watching in awe before Lesbianus put down her last green bean husk. Without looking at who sat at her bar, she asked, What will it be, fucktwarts? Tell me where Nara is living, Barnaby answered sternly. Based on the pause that Lesbianus gave, Keldorf looked worried for Barnaby. Lesbianus looked up, knowing who she would see. She walked over, dug her hand into her juicy steam seam, pulled it back out, and slapped Barnaby across the face. Who do you think you are, walking in here and asking for Naura? She asked angrily. I know I did my girl wrong. As much as I'd like to take that back, this isn't about Naura and me, replied Barnaby. The two of them eyed each other up for a minute. Keldorf wasn't sure if the look they gave one another was one of sexual tension or one of a desire to murder each other. But in the end, what was the difference? Shortner is back, Barnaby said, breaking the silence. Lesbianus paused before replying. I may not like you, Barnaby, but I know you if anyone wouldn't joke about something like that. What can I do to help? Tell me where Nara is staying, was all Barnaby said. Lesbianus coughed and then put her hands in her pants again. She rubbed around with her little man in the pink canoe for a little bit before pulling her hand out and giving her fingers a good sniff. Everybody knows the two people who scissor together stay connected for life. She's staying south for tomorrow in caves. Just north of Briar Glen. Barnaby bowed deeply. Thank you, Lesbianus. I am greatly indebted to you. Now, can my traveling companion and I partake in one of your aidles before we begin our travels? Lesbianus smiled and pulled Barnaby close. So close the two could almost kiss. Get your crusty old minge out of here and never come back. Barnaby could tell. 
this wasn't the time to protest. Instead of going back through the Kuotoa Mountains and treading across Shrublandia, Barnaby and Keldorf decided to traverse the Sea of Sodomy and come in near the Vag Bay on their journey to Sinaura. Unfortunately for them, Carl, the sea monster, had taken a giant turd in the middle of their path and they had to divert their ship, adding two days to their journey. It was hard to be too mad at Carl, though, for everyone knew it was his floating turds that eventually made islands. In fact, it was said that a grouping of his turds mixed with the sea turtle jizz had led to the main continent of Cumbria itself. They decided to land early just southwest at Briar Glen and made the rest of the two-day hike on foot. Tired and annoyed with one another, Keldorf and Barnaby arrived outside the hut they believed to be Nowra's. It hadn't taken them too long asking around the nearby village to know where Nowra lived. After all, you don't see many uniboobed merwomen outside of Lake Arisage. Barnaby stood a few feet from the door, paralyzed by fear. He knocked. After a moment, the door opened. A small girl appeared, her face sweet and innocent, her hair long and golden. She reminded Barnaby of his mother, even though he could hardly remember her. Hiya, said the girl cheerfully. Hello, we're looking for Naura. Does she live here? Mommy, the girl yelled. A woman came from further within the house. She walked slowly, but stopped in her tracks as she saw who stood in the doorway. Her face a mixture of fury and desire. Barnaby, she said under her breath. Naura, it's good to see you. Barnaby said, pushing Stephen back into his pants. Naura noticed the chub in Barnaby's trousers. She walked up, took a nearby walking stick, and slapped Stephen across the shaft. Barnaby crumbled in pain, believing his dick to have been broken in half. Deserve it was all Barnaby could moan. You show up here unannounced and all you can say is good to see you? Naura said with rage in her eyes. You have caused me some of the greatest pains in my life, Barnaby Lingus. You better have a good reason for coming here. Shortner, was all he said. Barnaby, Naura, Keldorf, and the little girl all sat in silence for a moment. The weight of that name hung in the air like a horny mule looking to impregnate his first mare. Now I let the two inside. Barnaby shared the details of what had happened with Shartner and Valspar. He explained how Shartner had changed and of the threats Shartner had made of revenge. Regrettably, Barnaby also mentioned his inability to attack Shartner himself. Cleaning a chimney was one thing, but channeling the mighty queef was something he hadn't done in almost five years. He had felt powerless. Nara sat in silence for a moment before replying. I'm sorry about Valspar, Barnaby. I truly am. He sounded like a good companion, Nara said with a heavy heart. But I think I know what we need to do. Plop. Barnaby reached around and pulled a roll of coins from his ass. Not at the time, Keldorf, Barnaby said in frustration. Just wanted everyone to know I was still here, Keldorf replied sheepishly. You've handled bigger, Barnaby. Get over it. Now what we need to do is go to hell, Nora interjected. Hell? Well, fuck you too, bitch, Keldorf said defensively. No, no, no. We need the help of someone in hell. If we want to defeat Shartner... We are going to need some added support. There's a man in the seventh circle of hell. His name is Del, and he is the last of the Rishimi, of which I am aware. He knew Korfart well, and trained him in the ways of the Queef, Nalra stated. Well, well how, how do we, we get, get there, there then? then? Keldorf and Barnaby asked in unison. The little girl came into the room and rested her head on Nalra's lap. Nalra stroked her hair and looked up at Barnaby and Keldorf. Follow me.